Have you ever wondered what Formula One would look like if the teams weren't holding back? For years, they've been spending fortunes to find tiny advantages. But there's a secret hiding in the rulebook. A car so fast it could lap the entire grid. The crazy part? It's completely legal, and no one will ever build it. This isn't some fantasy concept car. This is engineering reality, hidden in plain sight within the FIA's own technical regulations. And by the end, you'll know exactly what this theoretical machine would look like, why it would be unbeatable, and the brutal truth about why the politics of F1 will never let it see the track. But first, you need to understand something that most F1 fans never realize. Every regulation in this sport exists because someone found a way to exploit it. And right now, in 2025, those exploits are still there waiting for someone brave enough or stupid enough to use them. Let's start with the most devastating weapon this secret car would have. Ground effect pushed to its absolute legal limit. While teams estimate their cars generate well over a thousand kilograms of downforce at high speeds, this hypothetical design could push that to almost double. Here's how. The FIA technical regulations specify minimum floor dimensions, not maximum efficiency. While teams are constantly pushing the boundaries of what's allowed, this design would take that to an extreme. Living on the ragged edge of legality and exploiting untapped potential in the regulations. What if you didn't care about playing it safe? This machine would push every single surface to the exact mathematical limit. We're talking about Venturi tunnels shaped with computational fluid dynamics that would make NASA jealous. The edge seals, those crucial barriers that prevent air from escaping under the car, could be optimized to create a ground effect so powerful it would dramatically increase the car's suction to the tarmac. While current cars still lose significant downforce in turbulent air, this design would be so aerodynamically robust that the performance loss would be far less severe, allowing it to follow closely where others can't. But let's get technical about what this actually means. The floor's Venturi tunnels would use variable cross-sectional areas to accelerate airflow from 50 meters per second at the inlet to over 80 meters per second at the throat. That velocity increase creates a pressure differential of nearly 2,000 pascals, significantly more than what current cars achieve. The edge seal design would incorporate micro vortex generators every 50 millimeters along the seal's length. These tiny aerodynamic devices would create a curtain of rotating air that prevents high pressure air from the car's sides from bleeding under the floor. Current teams use maybe 20% of the legal edge seal area for vortex generation. This design would use 95%. Adrian Newey is famous for his view that a car's engine and aerodynamics must work in perfect harmony. Well, this car would push that philosophy to a new extreme. The downforce advantage alone would be worth 1.5 seconds per lap at most circuits. This level of aggressive design means any manufacturing deviation, even a fraction of a millimeter, could cause the entire concept to fail during scrutineering or on track. One tiny imperfection in the complex surface geometry and the entire aerodynamic concept collapses. This design wouldn't compromise, living on the knife's edge of perfection, and that's exactly why it's too dangerous to build. Weight distribution in F1 isn't just about balance, it's about tire loading, suspension geometry, and aerodynamic efficiency all working together. Current F1 cars must weigh a minimum of 800 kilograms without fuel, plus 82 kilograms for the driver and equipment. And while the regulations heavily restrict how you distribute that weight once the race starts, they don't prevent teams from making it a weapon from the very first lap. Teams currently place ballast to pass scrutineering, then hope for the best this phantom car would turn weight distribution into a weapon. The loophole lies in fuel load distribution. As your car burns fuel throughout the race, the weight balance changes. Most teams just accept this. This design would be engineered around it. Picture a single fuel tank bladder shaped so that as fuel burns off, the center of gravity moves in a predetermined optimal pattern for each phase of the race. The reality is that a typical F1 fuel tank holds 100 kilograms of fuel in a roughly rectangular shape behind the driver. As fuel burns, the center of gravity moves rearward by approximately 150 millimeters over the course of a race. Teams try to compensate with suspension adjustments, but they can't change the fundamental weight distribution once the car is under Parc Fermé. This design would have a fuel bladder with an irregular computer model shape. Instead of a simple rectangular design, it would use internal baffles and complex geometry to manage fuel slosh and control the fuel's center of gravity. This would allow the weight to be positioned more forward during the race's early stages for front-end grip, and then gradually shift rearward at a slower rate than a typical tank for better tire wear and straight-line stability in the final stint. The potential gain could be substantial, perhaps shaving several tenths off the lap time at circuits where weight distribution is critical. 
At Monaco, where every tenth counts, this could be the difference between pole position and starting fifth. No team does this because it requires completely rethinking how you design an F1 car. Instead of building a car and then adding ballast, you'd need to design the ballast placement first and build the car around it. That's a level of integration that would cost tens of millions in development. The ERS system adds another layer of complexity. The MGUK is capped at a maximum output of 120 kilowatts. This design wouldn't generate more power, but it would maximize energy recovery to ensure that 120 kilowatts is available for more of the lap, precisely when and where the driver needs it. The MGUH would be redesigned with a revolutionary mounting and cooling system. By placing the unit in a more thermally efficient location and using advanced cooling channels, it could operate closer to its optimal temperature range for longer. Current MGUH systems operate at maybe 70% efficiency. This design would achieve 85% efficiency by perfectly managing its thermal profile and integrating it seamlessly with the rest of the power unit. The MGUH's unlimited energy recovery is the real key. While the MGUK deployment is limited to 4 megajoules per lap, a more efficient MGUH would recover enough energy to constantly replenish the battery, meaning the driver could deploy that full 120 kilowatts of electric power far more often and for longer than a current car. Instead of having to manage ERS deployment strategically throughout the lap, this system would provide near continuous access to maximum electric power. The driver could use full ERS boost out of every corner, down every straight, whenever maximum performance is needed. Combined, these fuel and ERS optimizations could be worth 0.3 to 0.5 seconds per lap. At power circuits like Monza or Spa, this advantage would be devastating. The catch, this level of fuel and ERS optimization would require a completely bespoke power unit. No manufacturer would build this for one team because it would have zero road car relevance. The development cost would be astronomical, and the political fallout would be nuclear. Let's address the elephant in the room. Active aerodynamics. The FIA has banned active aero for decades. So how could this car use it? In 2025, the only legal active aerodynamic device is DRS. Everything else is static. The real innovation lies in flexible aerodynamics throughout the car. The FIA has introduced new stricter load tests for 2025 to curb flexible wings. But this design would be a masterclass in exploiting the remaining flexibility. Designing a wing that passes the static load test but uses varying carbon fiber layups to flex in a controlled way at racing speeds. This would allow the rear wing to behave like a standard DRS flap at low speeds, but at high speeds, its controlled flex would naturally open the slot gap to its maximum legal limit, providing a near perfect drag reduction even before the driver hits the DRS zone. Think Red Bull's flexible wings from 2021, but taken to the mathematical limit of what's legal. The front wing would be rigid enough to pass the FIA's enhanced load tests, but would use strategic carbon fiber orientation to create controlled flex under racing conditions. The technical implementation would use carbon fiber with varying fiber orientations. The wing's main plane would use zero degree carbon fiber for maximum stiffness in the load test direction, but 45 degree fiber in areas where controlled flex is desired. This creates a wing that passes scrutineering, but optimizes its shape during racing. The brake ducts offer another opportunity, while cooling requirements are regulated and the aerodynamic benefit of brake duct design is heavily restricted, clever engineers find loopholes. This design would have brake ducts that provide the minimum legal cooling while maximizing aerodynamic performance. The brake duct inlets would be shaped as perfect NACA ducts, aerodynamically optimized air intakes that create zero drag while providing maximum airflow. The internal ducting would use vortex generators to increase heat transfer efficiency, allowing smaller duct openings while maintaining adequate cooling. Combined, these aerodynamic optimizations could be worth 0.5 to 0.7 seconds per lap at high-speed circuits. This level of aerodynamic optimization would be incredibly fragile. One small change in track conditions, one slight manufacturing variation, and the entire aerodynamic concept could collapse. It's the kind of risk that could cost you a championship in a single weekend. Current F1 teams treat tire strategy as something that happens during the race. This theoretical car would treat tire strategy as something that's built into the car itself. Tire performance isn't just about the rubber compound. It's about tire temperature, tire pressure, and how the car's setup interacts with the tire's construction. This design would be engineered to make any tire compound work optimally on any track, not through banned active systems, but through revolutionary mechanical design that could be rapidly adjusted in the garage before Parc Fermé. The suspension geometry would be designed for unprecedented adjustability. 
Hard tires need different suspension settings than soft tires. Most teams compromise with a setup that works reasonably well for all compounds. This design wouldn't compromise. Here's how it would work in reality. The suspension would be designed with modular components and interchangeable mounting points that could be swapped out and fine-tuned with precision during practice sessions. This would allow engineers to perfectly dial in the car for a specific tire compound and track condition, something most teams don't have the time or engineering flexibility to do. The brake system would be designed for optimal tire temperature management through a revolutionary brake drum design. Different compounds require different thermal management strategies. The brake drum itself, a component that cannot be changed during the race, would use a modular approach with different internal channels and vanes that can be pre-configured for each track. For stints requiring tire heating, the drums would be made from steel with high thermal mass. For stints requiring tire cooling, the drums would be made from a carbon-carbon composite with integrated fins. While these cannot be changed mid-race, a team could install a specific setup for qualifying in the race, knowing exactly how it will affect tire temperature. Even the wheel rim design would be optimized for tire performance through a modular approach. Different rim profiles for different compounds, all selected before the car goes into Parc Fermé. The wheel rims would use a quick change outer section design. For soft compounds requiring maximum heat dissipation, the rim would have deep cooling channels and a wide profile. For hard compounds requiring heat retention, the rim would have a narrow profile with minimal cooling channels. This choice would be made in the garage before the race, allowing for a pre-optimized setup. The real innovation, predictive tire strategy through advanced data systems. This design would have sensors and data systems that could predict tire degradation with unprecedented accuracy. Not just measuring current tire performance, but predicting future performance based on track conditions, weather and driving style. Tire pressure sensors would be embedded every 30 degrees around the rim, providing real-time pressure mapping across the entire contact patch. Temperature sensors would be embedded in the tire sidewalls at three different depths, providing thermal gradient data that could predict internal tire degradation. This data would feed into an AI system that could predict tire performance 10 laps into the future with 95% accuracy. The system would know exactly when to pit, which compound to use, and how to optimize the car's setup for each stint through pre-race mechanical adjustments. The performance advantage? At circuits where tire strategy is crucial, like Hungary or Singapore, this could be worth several tenths per lap in race conditions through perfect setup optimization for each compound. The cost would be enormous. This level of tire optimization would require completely rethinking how you design an F1 car. Instead of building a car and then figuring out tire strategy, you'd need to design the tire strategy first and build the car around it. Let's add it up. Ground effect optimization, potentially 1.5 seconds. Weight distribution mastery, several tenths. Fuel flow and ERS optimization, 0.3 to 0.5 seconds. Aerodynamic perfection, 0.5 to 0.7 seconds. Tire strategy revolution, substantial gains in race conditions. Instead of having a performance advantage, this car would be in a different category of racing machine, with a potential cumulative gain of up to four seconds per lap if all its theoretical advantages were combined. This car would qualify on pole by margins not seen since the 1980s. It would lap the field in race conditions. It would make every other car on the grid look like they're driving in slow motion. And it would never ever be built. First, the cost. Conservative estimate, $500 million in development costs. That's more than most teams' entire annual budgets. The level of precision required, the bespoke components, the specialized manufacturing, it would bankrupt any team that attempted it. Second, the risk. This beast would live on the absolute edge of what's legal. One small mistake, one component that's a millimeter out of specification, one interpretation of the regulations that the stewards disagree with, and your entire season is over. But the real reason this car will never be built isn't financial or technical, it's political. The moment any team showed up with this level of performance advantage, the FIA would panic. Emergency technical directives would be issued, regulations would be changed mid-season. The car would be protested by every other team on the grid. Remember what happened when Mercedes dominated with their hybrid technology? The FIA changed the regulations. When Red Bull found aerodynamic advantages, new technical directives. When any team gets too far ahead, the sport intervenes. This theoretical machine would be fast and it would expose how broken the current regulatory system is. It would prove that the level playing field that F1 claims to want is actually impossible under the current rules. And that's something the sport can't allow. But what should really make you angry is this. Teams know these loopholes exist. 
engineers at Mercedes, Red Bull, Ferrari, they've all done the calculations. They know exactly how much performance is being left on the table and they've all agreed not to pursue it. It's not written down anywhere. There's no formal agreement, but there's an understanding in the paddock. Don't push certain boundaries too far or you'll ruin it for everyone. It's a conspiracy of mediocrity. Teams deliberately holding back their engineering capabilities to maintain the illusion of close competition. Think about that. In a sport that's supposed to be about pushing the absolute limits of technology and human performance, the teams have agreed to limit themselves. The conceptualized masterpiece I've described is an engineering reality being deliberately suppressed, not science fiction. And the fans, the fans are being cheated out of seeing what Formula One could really be. Imagine if Mercedes had built this car in 2020 instead of the W11. Instead of winning races by 20 seconds, they would have won by two minutes. Instead of lapping up to third place, they would have lapped the entire field. It would have been the most dominant performance in motorsport history, and it would have killed Formula One as a spectacle. That's the paradox of this design. It would be the greatest engineering achievement in F1 history, and it would destroy the sport. So the teams don't build it, the FIA pretends the loopholes don't exist, and fans are left wondering why the racing isn't as exciting as it could be. The secret F1 car exists in the regulations. It's been there all along, waiting for someone brave enough or crazy enough to build it. But in a sport where politics matter more than performance, where entertainment value trumps engineering excellence, that car will remain forever theoretical. The secret F1 car that could beat everyone will never be built because Formula One doesn't actually want to be beaten. And that might be the most disappointing truth of all. The ghost car lives in the shadows of the regulations, a specter of what could be but never will be. If you think F1 should unleash these engineering monsters instead of hiding behind political agreements, smash that like button, Tell me in the comments which loophole shocked you most and subscribe because the secrets I'm uncovering are just getting started.